Today, we're going to do the impossible, a 30% ABV mead. Okay, now, can you really use yeast to ferment to 30%? No. But can you make a mead that's 30% ABV? Yes. For that, we gotta start with a mead. So we're gonna start with three and a half pounds of honey. And what kind of honey did we use? We used wildflower honey. And it's, it's still going in, as you can tell. It's just barely dripping off of there. So we're gonna do that, and then we need to add some water. So we're gonna be adding 96 fluid ounces of water because we know that the volume displaced by our honey plus this water equals a full gallon. And I'm gonna use the heat of the water. It's, it's probably like 100 degrees Fahrenheit, just a little bit over body temperature uh, to help melt that honey and get it off the funnel at least. And yes, we weighed the, the uh, honey going in. Um, so if you don't have a scale, I highly suggest getting a scale. Now I'm only gonna put in about half because we wanna get this to mix. And when it's not full, it's easier to do that. But I require a solid bone. Now, of course, everything we're using here has been sanitized in. <laughs> including this, what I call the thumb saver or full bung, no hole, hard, solid. solid, yeah, that. I, you can tell that's what I call it all the time, right? I usually call it my thumb saver bunk. So what I want to do now is mix this up. I want to get all the bejesus out. I haven't said that in a while because we've been using the bigger, the bigger fermenters. Part of this is I'm aerating the must as well. That's the advantage to smaller batches is you can do this by hand. If you have to do this with a larger batch, you're gonna need a drill attachment, things like that to aerate. Aeration is very important in the beginning stages of a fermentation and it's very bad to do after alcohol is present. But in the beginning, you definitely want some. It helps the colony to build. Wow, that mixed up quick. See, warm water really does the trick. Just be careful when you take the bung back out. It looks out. like there's a little bit still down here. All right. What's my rule? If you think you're done, go another two minutes. Be careful when you pull the bung back out. Sometimes they like to spit at you. And this is now sugary, sticky, nasty. Well, I mean, it's not nasty, it's honey water. So it's not that nasty. Um, Okay, you might be curious why we're doing three and a half pounds. We usually do three pounds. It's because we're trying to get a little higher ABV out of this mead to start with. And then there is a part two that's all in this video, but where we get this to go even higher. So let's uh, add some more water. Actually, at this point, you, you know what, ahead. before we add the water, I'm gonna add our yeast nutrients. Now we're using Fermato, as we always do, 2.5 grams dissolved in a little bit of water. Just gonna pour that right in. And what that does is it gives the yeast a little extra vitamins, minerals, you know, the whole healthy nutrition thing to make sure that they can actually do what we need them to do. All the ingredients, all their amounts, and links to purchase them if you need to will be included in the description below. Right. Now, I'm going to be adding an optional ingredient though. I think it's really not optional. It's wine tannin. If you want, you could just use a cup of straight black tea. It adds a little mouthfeel, adds a little complexity and depth to this brew. Um, for this though, I don't need the funnel in there. Can you remove the funnel for just a second? I'm just doing half a teaspoon. I'm gonna see if I can get it in there without touching the sides. Nope. Nope. <laughs> oh well. This is actually made from, uh, it's, it's oak extract is what they call it. So I believe it is actually like a charred oak product that they grind up into a powder. That's basically what this is. So it'll add the equivalent or a similarity to oak aging this afterwards. So let's put the funnel back on. Do My you hand do is sticky. Your hand is sticky. Do you want to do your fancy pour thing to see if we can get some of that in there? Oh, see, this has a nice lip on it, spout, so you can do this. Maybe. Did I get it? It's, it's being resilient. It's res it is very resistant. Resistance is futile! Just splash over the side. <laughs> Alright, forget about it. No, I'm fine. I'm good. Right. Look at this. Oh, yeah. No funnel necessary. Uh, no, not really. Whoops. <laughs> It wouldn't be a City Setting Brews video if we didn't make a mess of some kind. It's just a little water. It's okay. Nothing to see here. <laughs> now, 
part of that was we have a lot of foam here. See how much, how filled that is? That's going to be a problem down the line. What's going to happen after fermentation starts is we're probably going to need to use a blow-off tube, which is basically just you put a piece of silicone in the bung and run that into a mason jar filled with sanitizer water. It's not a big deal. Do that for the first day or two just so that it doesn't get stuck and fill your airlock and pop the airlock off. But my hand is sticky. I need to dunk them in turbos. I'll be right back. Once I've added more water, definitely want to give this another mix. So I'm just going to put the uh, solid bung in there, thumb saver bung, whatever you want to call it. And I'm just going to upend it a couple times to get it mixed through because I don't want to make any more foam. It's foamy. Very foam. That should be mixed up enough. Now we take a reading for that cylinder, hydrometer, and the master baster. There's an extra S in there for those of you who are wondering. Yes. I'm expecting this to be around like 1.2 something, something, somewhere in that range because we did do three and a half. Bubbles, go away bubbles. 1.120 on the nose. All right, because everything was sanitized, I can put it back into the fermenter. In this case, I might not want to, but I'm going to anyway. <laughs> I'm gonna be greedy here. Remember, we're gonna lose some to sediment at the bottom when we rack, so I like to get as much as you can, but hey, you know, you do what you gotta do. All righty. And then, last but not least, but to make it work, we need to add some yeast. What kind of yeast are we using? We're using Ristar Premier Blanc. Now why are we using Premier Blanc? Because it goes to 18% ABV. <laughs> That's pretty much the reason. <laughs> Sometimes we look at, you know, most times we look at what kind of esters do they produce? What kind of situation does it like to be in? And yeah, I have to use scissors, Red Star. Um, but in this case, we actually don't want this to stall and I want it to go dry so that we can work on this more later. So we're trying to get as much as we can. This should go to something in like the 16 or so percent range. So 18% yeast can't read. Hopefully they, uh, overestimate and they just chew through everything and make it go dry. I'm using a whole packet and I'm just going to dump it in very, very carefully. So as it does not touch the sides. Remember operation. Takes a very steady hand. Don't touch the sides. And you know how hard that is to do when you're pouring yeast like this? Because you can't see them. Well, you gotta splash your packet. You That's know? only half the packet, yeah. believe it or not. Do you wanna do half the packet? I'm, no, I'm doing the whole oh, thing. Okay. And then when you thwack the packet is when it's all gonna get, a, get messy. See, they all stuck to the side. They will not achieve their destiny. <laughs> okay, all that's left now is to put an airlock and a bung on this guy, take some notes, put it in the fermentation station. This will probably take a few weeks. And once we see that airlock activity has slowed to a minimum or none, we'll be back to show you its first reading. All right, so we're actually probably not going to put this in the fermentation station because we just made it and we have a lot of foam and minimal head space. So we're actually going to put it on a lipped tray. So that way, in case it gets active and makes a mess, that lip tray is going to catch the mess rather than it ending up everywhere. We're also probably going to have to put a rubber band on this. Yeah, it doesn't want to stay Because on. the bung doesn't want to stay in there. It's a little bit too large. Regardless, we'll be back to show you the first reading. Okay, so this has been going for like 19 days. Um, the airlock activity seems to have slowed, but we do still see little bubbles coming up the side, which could be degassing, could be fermentation. But you know, there's one way to find out for sure. That is to get a reading. Not clear. <laughs> So that means it's not quite ready to be racked yet, most likely, but uh, we'll see. Normally things start clearing out when they're pretty close to being done. I think it might still be working a little bit. It is at 1.020. Now this started at 1.120, as you might recall, but we used Premier Blanc, which is an 18% yeast. So right now it's at 13.5%, but it's still got 20 points to go. Isn't it April? I put March 18th. I put 11 18 earlier. <laughs> it's one of those years. <laughs> anyway, what I think I'd like to do with this is I don't think it's fully finished. I don't think it's finished either. I'm watching those little yeah, bubbles. Yeah, it's still like, going. Yeah. But I think let's add some yeast hulls, give it a good shake, oh, sure. put it back. 20 points, even if it doesn't go the full 20 points, I'm okay with that because of what we are what we have coming and we're going to end up sweetening this anyway. But uh, I'd like to see if we can get this to finish. So let me just pour the sample back in. And we'll grab some yeast hulls and get to it. It does smell quite like a mead though, which, you know, it should. Well, it's better than some of the things it could smell like. I say that because people say all the time, oh, this doesn't smell good. Or what is it supposed to smell like? The best I can say is it smells kind of like if you took honey and vodka and mixed them together. That's about what it smells like. With maybe just a hint of um, like something bitter 
or slightly astringent, but not a lot of it, just a little bit. Um, we've had reports of people saying that their neighbors complained and that's why they don't ferment in their house anymore or their apartment. And I'm like, okay, if, if our neighbors knew that we were fermenting because of the smell, we have a serious problem, yeah. okay? Even if you had an apartment, there's no way someone in the next room should know you're smelling, let alone the next unit over. Should know you're brewing. What it's did like I say? Smelling. <laughs> Yeah, that. You know what I mean? There's just no way. If it's putting out that kind of a smell, you've done something very wrong, okay? It could be, like, if it's a rotten egg smell, you didn't aerate enough, there's ways to fix that. Um, I've never had to actually do it. It does age out and usually just degas it a lot and shake it up a lot, and you can get it to kind of clear, um, but there are other ways of doing it. Uh, that's about the worst one that we hear about most times. Yeah, the the worst odor we've gotten in the fermentation room, like where we have all of the vessels fermenting, is it smells like maybe somebody spilled some wine on the floor. Yeah, it actually smells like a spoiled fruit. Yeah. At the, and I mean, we're talking, we have eight, nine, or ten of these things going at once. But if you walk in that room, unless it was closed up for a while, you don't really smell it. So... Keep that in mind. It shouldn't have a really bad smell. It shouldn't have an overly strong smell, not even in the beginning. So I'm always confused by that when people tell us that. It, it, that makes me think something went wrong somewhere. You, something has not been done exactly right, but I don't want to harp on that too much. Yeast holes. Yeast holes, right. Another question that comes up often is people will say, oh, well, should I add more yeast? if I have a stall, or should I add yeast nutrients if I have a stall? Well, we used yeast nutrients in the beginning of this. What we're using now is just yeast hulls, which some people use as yeast nutrient. To me, it's a weak form of yeast nutrient. It's not the best, but we found that it works great for fixing stalls, because really it's just dead yeast. That's really all it is. So it offers only the most basic ingredients that they need to work, and when they just have a little bit more to go, it seems to work best. Now this hasn't stalled because we see signs of it still going. We're just putting this in kind of as a little helper. Yeah, a little bush. it's mommy's little helper. All right, so now we're gonna put the lid back on and I'm gonna stir it up. So it's probably gonna create quite a bit of gas. So I wanna be, well, let's not, don't seal it up yet because right, when I shake it up, I might have to remove that. Okay. Just, <laughs> just so that it doesn't explode. know what you're doing here. I'm gonna see how gassy this is. See, sometimes just the degassing itself is enough to get things going, but getting everything moving again, getting any any yeast that might have said, hey, I can't find any more sugars, and drop to the bottom, get them back up in the liquid again, that sometimes can help. That's usually enough. You see all that gas that's in there? They don't like to uh, live in their own waste, and alcohol and gas are their waste products. So we wanna get some of that out. Cleaning up their environment. Yeah, and it takes a little while. I'm just, and it spits at you. I'm just gonna keep doing this for a while. Then we're gonna put it back on the shelf and we'll see you in uh, probably another week to check on this. Okay, another week has gone by. It's time to give this another check. It was kind of stalled or going really slow last time we checked it. Could just be because we've had a little bit colder weather lately that some of our stuff is taking longer and I'm just impatient. We did add yeast holes to it. It's not clear. And I do see bubbles coming up the side still, which lends me to believe that it's not actually done yet and that's okay. Up to about five weeks or so is pretty much acceptable for fermentation, depending on what you're making, obviously. Some things take a little longer, some take a little less. This one, we started fairly high with a 1.120 gravity. It has gone down slightly from last time, but not by much. There's a lot of gas in there. Yeah. It actually only went down to 1.016. Let me mark that down. So it only went down four points, but still it's going down. So let's give it some more time, shake it up again and let it go. What I mean by shake it up, let me dump this in first. By dump, I mean pour carefully so as to not disturb too, too much because I don't want to oxygenate at this point. By mix up, I'm just literally going to do this. You might think I'm oxygenating. <laughs> But if you look, there's a lot of foam coming out. A little bit of oxygen probably did get in there. That's just the way things work, but it's gonna get forced back out. There's a lot of liquid in here, so it's really hard to get a good swirl going, but I do see a lot of gases coming out. Let's put that airlock back on 
and I'll give it some more swirls. Degassing is a good idea when you have something that might be struggling a little bit. It'll keep it from producing off flavors and you'll see that airlock start going. Oh yeah, see? Now with the airlock on, you can shake the bejesus out of it and it doesn't really matter. You're not gonna get anything in there. It just makes a mess. Yeah. <laughs> See, it bubbles out the top, and that's why I was doing it without, but you know. Now, with this particular brew, it's okay if it's 16 points shy. That's not really a problem. I'd like it to go further, so we're gonna let this go for another week or two, and we'll be back to give you an update on how it's doing. It's been a little over two weeks. It's been like two and a half weeks or so. So last we checked, this was at 1.016. It had kind of almost sort of stalled a little bit. And even if it did stall, it's okay because um, we have plants. It's clearing beautifully well though. Wouldn't be CSB if I didn't make a mess. Still sitting at 1.016. This started at um, 1.120. It's a little on the high side. We use Premier Blanc yeast. Let me get the calculator the teacher said I would never have handy and calculate what our ABV is right now. Cause this is all, there's gonna be a lot of math for this one, okay? I apologize for that, but there is. So we start at 1.120 minus 1.016. That gives us 104 points of gravity chewed up times 135 is 14% ABV. So this is already not too shabby. Okay, so Premier Blanc goes to 18%, which means we have to pass 18%, but we said we're going to 30, so it just doesn't matter. Anyway, so let me close this up. Put that over there. But that means we need to do more math. By more math, we need to know exactly the volume that we have thus far before continuing forward. Precisely. So that means we need our favorite pitcher. that actually look at the description of our videos know that I do a lot of work there and put links to everything that we use and the ingredients list and the volumes and all that stuff to try to help you out. I write the description. And the picture is listed as our favorite picture because just saying just a, awesome. a one gallon pitcher with measurements is boring. No, this is so much more than that. This is awesome. We love this picture. I'm done. Okay. I'm going to take the sample and pour it directly into our favorite pitcher. Very carefully. So I'm also going to do one more little plug of self-promotion here. We have the City Setting Brews channel that you're watching right now, but if you're interested in seeing me being completely silly and meeting one of our cats and hearing him talk, and I mean actually speak, um, Inigo is the co-star of the show. I have another channel called The Booze Bulletin. It's all about like alcohol news and things like that from around the world. There's some jokes, there's some silliness. It's fun. Um, we'll put a link to that channel in the bottom of, or in the description for this video too. And um, you know, just go check it out. There's a few videos up there right now, but um, I'm it's making fun. new it's ones. It's a good time. I'm making new ones every week. Anyway, so that's done. And now we're gonna rack it. We need to get it off the leaves and we're gonna put it in a pitcher. Now, we are going to be doing some other things to it. So there's gonna be two rackings here, but it's only because we need the measurement off the pitcher. If the little big mouth bubbler that we're gonna rack it into for the final storage of it had markings on it that were accurate, we would just use that. So that's why we're, you're gonna see us rack twice. But um, just suffice to say, we're gonna rack this. We have a video on racking, so if you don't know how to do it, um, we have a full video on it. But basically it's source, destination, auto siphon, hose in the bottom, cap on because of lease, put it in halfway, activate the actuator of the auto siphon, get it going, and let it go. Okay, it's been racked. And we have 120 ounces of this brew. So that's 120 ounces. I'm taking notes on purpose because it'll, it'll make sense in just a minute. So we have 120 ounces at 14.04%. That means we need to double that ABV to get it to 30%. That requires a little bit of math. So I happen to know the rum we're going to use. Oh, did I say rum? That's right. We're using rum to fortify this up to 30% because why not? Can you grab the rum that we're going to use for I this? I can. So we bought this bottle of oh, rum. It is a Hamilton 151 overproof. So it is 75.5% ABV. That is important because I didn't want to have so much rum being added that it became rum with a little bit of mead. I wanted it to still be a mead. Now, if anyone has a problem with fortifying a mead, let me just remind you of a little company called Dansk Mod that makes fortified meads. 
They just do. <laughs> That's why all their stuff is like 18 and 20% because they fortify them. It's one way to not have to pasteurize at the end. We're doing it just to say that we made a 30% mead, but also because that way we don't have to pasteurize and we can sweeten this to taste. But let me just do some math here. So if I was to take this entire 750 mils, which 750 mils is 25.5 ounces, I believe. Okay, so to calculate this out, I'm gonna take 120 ounces times 14.04% ABV. Gives me 1684.8. The number's not really important, it's just the math that's important. Then I'm gonna to add to that my 25.5 ounces of 75.5% ABV, and that gives me a grand total of 3610.05, but now I need to divide this by the total. So it's 120 plus 25.5, gives me 145.5. So I divide by 145.5, gives me 24.8% ABV. Damn, we're not gonna get it. Yeah, we are. We have more rum. We do actually have more rum, but it's only 63% ABV. I know, only. So instead, I found some Everclear. It's about half a bottle, so we'll see what we got. We might have to scavenge a couple things together, but we're gonna get 30%. So let me start measuring, because what I need to do is pour these into a container that I can measure. So this needs to get racked back to a little big mouth bubbler. Bubbler, yeah, little big mouth bubbler. Those are hard to say. And then I'm gonna pour these two into the pitcher so I can get a measurement on that. So we're just gonna rack this, be right back. All right, yeah. so we have it racked and we just set the lid on there just to keep stuff out of there or whatever. And I'm going to pour the entire contents of this bottle into here. So we had a little discussion about this because I'm like, why do you, why are you pouring the rum in with the Everclear? Because there are separate things. But then I'm not the math person. I'm not the number person. And Brian they're reminded the me ABV. they're the same ABV. So essentially they are the same. That's why I wanted to use the Everclear because the same ABV as the rum. Yes, I know you can get higher proof um, Everclear in places other than Florida, but yeah, in Florida, this is what we get. We're Florida. By the way, that rum smells really nice. And I don't mind using Everclear because we have a majority of rum, and I was right, it's it's 25.5. Um, but we do have some neutral spirits here that are just going to boost the alcohol, which is really what we're trying to do at this point, without adding more flavor, because that rum is going to have a lot of flavor to it. Yeah. So I'm just going to pour this all in. And if you're thinking this is a really convenient way to use up a lot of the random liquors that you might have partial <laughs> bottles of, you are you're not right. wrong. This is a great way to do that. <laughs> okay, so that's that. It's like, you know, those college days, not that I really remember that much, um, of just making a punch and everybody drinks some. I missed out on those days. Um, so I have, stop bouncing. Looks like I have 39 ounces altogether. So those is a little over 10 in there. So let's do the math yet again. So we have 39 ounces of our 75.5. So times 75.5, right? Plus 120 ounces of 14.04 divided by the grand total, which is going to be 159 ounces. 159 gives me 29.1. Oh, gosh. We're doing it. We're going all the way. <laughs> so what we want to do first is we're going to pour this into here. Very carefully. But let me write down some numbers just so I don't forget what I did. Okay. So I want to pour this in carefully so as to not oxidize. Just tilt it to the side a little bit, and then we can pour that right in. It's going to change the color drastically, too. I think it's all going to get nice and dark, which is why Derica really wanted the spiced rum kind of thing to change that color. Okie dokie. That is a gorgeous color, by the way. And now we have another rum, a plain white rum that's 63%. So I have to figure out how much of that I need in order to add to do this. So um, I'm just gonna guess at like four ounces because I think we need about four. So if I do the math yet again, 29.94, five ounces. We're gonna do five ounces, five ounces. Whoops. You know what though? No, we're gonna do six ounces. You know why? That's we're just insane. gonna make sure we are past 30%. Let me go get a measuring cup to do yeah, six. Because it's gonna be easier than doing it. All right. Is this there... is a great picture for larger volumes, but right. when you get into... All right, let me go get a small measuring cup. 
All right, so this is the white rum. Um, it got decent reviews, just like the other one. Um, we're not really big on rum, so we just go with, you know, what we could find. Because overproofed over rum is not that easy to find anymore. So six ounces. We're going to overshoot 30% by a little bit, I hope. <laughs> well, the four did, like, well, here, almost one. Let's, let's be diligent. Six ounces, right? Oh, notes. you want me to do the math? All right, I'll do the math. Are you ready? If you haven't figured this out by now, this is actually pretty simple. We have 120 ounces, right? I'm gonna just break it down. 120 ounces of 14.04%. So 120 times 14.04. Think of it as parts, 120 parts of 14%, right? Plus, and because calculators do the math properly, they do the multiplication and then the addition in the middle, it, it works. Plus 39 ounces of 75.5. Now that includes the Everclear and the rum because they're both 75.5. The first times one. 75.5 plus, Six of 63%. Now I need my total. Because my total is 159 plus six, it's now 165. So I just divide that by 165, gives us 30.34% success. We have made 30% mead. Now- Well, you gotta pour this in first. Oh yeah, well, yeah. And now, and now we do. Hey, don't, don't spill any. All right, 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 right. These things don't pour well. You gotta commit. Just get right in there. It's thirty percent. It's like nothing's gonna happen to this anymore. <laughs> this is an antiseptic now. I mean, <laughs> all right. What I do need though is a spoon to mix this up. All right. So what I want to do is just give this a mix. See, now we've achieved the ABV we want through some serious <laughs> machinations to get there. Um, machinations, machinations, whatever, you know what I mean? I want to give it a taste. I don't expect this to taste amazing at this point because there's a lot of rum in here. Nothing's mellowed together. It probably isn't gonna be great. There was a little bit of sweetness, but I think it's probably gonna need more. That said, it smells quite nice. It smells like a very strong mead. I'm getting more of the rum smell than anything else, but wow. The rum mixed with the mead, that's incredible. It needs more honey. It, it, I mean, it's not done, it's not, but, but wow guys, this is good already. This is already quite drinkable. Put that on the rocks in a glass and- We haven't made a rum and mead cocktail yet. No, you have not, but we're making one right now. All right, so let me grab some honey and we're gonna start sweetening this up. And we're gonna sweeten it our way. Okay, so we have here some honey that was sent to us by a viewer, Jeremy Burke. By the way, if anybody wants to send us honey from their neck of the woods, we are open to that. We, uh, we like that. It gives us some different stuff that we don't have access to here. Just please don't send us some super obscure honey because then... Yeah, and let us know that you're sending it so that we know to expect it. Yeah, because if, if other people can't join in the experience, then yeah. that kind of defeats the purpose. I mean, this is, this is uh, pure American honey from Star Farms, Pleasant Hill, Oregon. So it's from an actual apiary and all that kind of thing. So but anyway, so our way of sweetening is I pour some honey in, mix it up, we taste it. So let's pour some honey in. I think I want this to be pretty sweet to make it like mead, like mead, you know? Mead. Like when you think of mead, you think of something that's super strong, gonna knock you on your butt, that's a little thick and viscous and has a sweet taste, right? That's what I think of anyway. Like if, if you've ever watched the 13th Warrior, you know, with Anto Antonio Banderas, that is where a lot of people have the idea of mead. It's made from honey. It's made from <laughs> I love that line, love the movie. But that's what you think of. But really, it's just, it's wine. However, I wanted to make something that was more reminiscent of what I think of when I think of mead. Technically, I guess this would be more like grog. I don't know what name you're going to put on it. I just want to drink it, so it doesn't matter to me. I'm going to call it awesome. awesome. We're just going to put awesome on the bottles. So the thing that Brian said earlier that we don't really drink much rum, it is a fallacy. I drink a lot of rum. We well, don't drink I don't, 151. I don't drink a lot of that particular rum, but I, I do you drink have... Kraken and Sailor Jerry and, and a couple others. my crazy coconut rum. Oh, yeah, Malibu coconut rum. <laughs> I, I'm not sure that qualifies as rum. It's rum adjacent. <laughs> it's like a rum liqueur. But I really do enjoy rum-based cocktails, so... 
This is now a rum-based cocktail. This is now a rum-based cocktail. <laughs> now, just to be on, just to be completely in the clear, we have 120 ounces of mead, and then we used uh, 45 ounces of non-mead. So that's like one third of the total volume. So 25% of this is not mead, which means this is 75% mead. So the main ingredient is still honey and mead. To me, this still qualifies. I mean, it's a stretch. Obviously. And that's why we chose honey as our sweetener because we wanted to stick with the mead theme. Now, if you're familiar with the rum, they're made from sugar cane. So right. we had the option to go with the flavors that were already inherent by using sugar or using molasses, and it would blend well with the flavors in this brew. But because this is a mead and we're wanting to push the mead, we stuck with honey. Yep. We could have just made this into a, a serious wine if we really wanted to, but eh. mead, make mead. I'm not sure you could call it wine with with all the rum. It's, it's port. It's like a fortified wine. Oh, oh, okay. There's a lot of fortified wines. Name and closure. It it gets name and closure. Nomenclature. Nomenclature. I swapped my O and A. Name and closure. Name and closure. <laughs> That's the CSB <laughs> word of the day. <laughs> I don't even know what I'm saying anymore. Uh, words. They don't matter. That's what I was saying. By the way, this is the first alcohol either of us has had in like three days. So we're not drunk. This is just the way we are. I'm hoping this just is divine as it is. I it was pretty close to divine in my it was, opinion. It was really good already. Yeah. Like it was actually quite nice. So I'm hoping. Oops, that's a that's a big pour. Uh-oh. I'm hoping it's really good now. Okay, now I get honey on the smell. It's like a scotch mead. You, do you say we're done? But we only have this much honey left. I could go sweeter or I could keep it the way it is. It's wonderful. I don't, I don't think want I want to go sweeter. Because what's going to happen now is this is going to sit and mellow for a while. I'm going to put it back in the fermentation station, give it another week or two, and then we'll be back to give you our assessment taste at that point of what we think of it. But right now... We have a 30% mead that is really amazing tasting. Like, wow, this is shockingly good. And that's because you start with a good base recipe, add a decent quality spirit to it. I mean, we don't really know how good that one is, but it got good reviews. Yeah. You end up with a good product. Garbage in, garbage out. So if you have a crappy mead and you add crappy cheap spirits to it, I mean, don't get me wrong, Everclear ain't exactly the best. We only used, you know, 14 ounces. So the one thing I'm going to say here is as far as the back sweetening, we're going to take a note that we back sweetened with honey. But we're going to we're, take a we're, reading. We're going to, but is the reading even going to tell us anything with all the alcohol? It'll tell me something. Let's do it. All right. Okay. The reason why I actually want to do this and the reason why Derica had some uh, apprehension is when you add more alcohol, it's going to drop the gravity reading. So this will probably be sweeter than the gravity reading would suggest because ethanol has a lower specific gravity than water and we added a lot of ethanol to this. So let's find out what we did. Now, as I said before, one thing that's very important and the reason why a lot of people fortify is so that you don't have to pasteurize. You don't have to stabilize in any way. That is stabilized. It's done. There is no yeast that we know of in this world that could ferment past the 30% alcohol that's already in here. So right. 1.012. So it's not even super sweet, but that's probably more like 1.022. Sure. So Let's my, in. my initial point that I was trying to make is that because Does that mean anything? Of, because of all the additional alcohol, it's difficult for us to relay to you how much honey we added to this. But if you followed our procedure and you added the same amount of alcohol that we did before adding just the honey, gauge. then you can use that reading. Right. To See, some... it's just to get a gauge of where the sweetness level is at that alcohol level. I just had to get more. It's got a lovely smokiness to it. Ooh. Damn, that's good. But you have to wait till our final tasting before we give you any more notes. Yeah, I'm not going to say anything else. I'm just going to sit here and make yummy noises. Sniff it. It's, yeah. it's that kind of thing. You can just sit here and smell. I mean, here. You want, you want more? Smell, smell, yeah, smell, smell, smell. It's, it's, good. it's good. It's good. Does anybody get that one? Give me a clue. It's the same movie as the last one. 
No, it's... Yeah, it is. Oh, yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. <laughs> All right, so here's a little thing about our movie clips. Don't argue with us on what movie clip we're Somebody quoting. Somebody argued with me. We're the one putting they the called clip me, in there. They actually called me names that got blocked on YouTube. That's like... For saying that it wasn't a movie that they thought it was. They thought that the... Um, no, I'm not going to get into it, yeah. but it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Just don't argue. There's yeah. no, pain, no, no, no reason to argue. That's right. If I quote a movie, it's because I'm quoting a movie because I know it's in the movie. But anyway, this is going to go back on the shelf. See you in a week or two. Let you know how this is. <laughs> okay, so this has been sitting for a week. We loosened the lid. And it's time to sample. It smells strong. Like, I can smell it already. But as I recall, this tasted pretty good. So. so this is our... It's not really final tasting. It's more like... Or pre-aging tasting. Pre-aging tasting. It's the pat taste. <laughs> there we go. The pat taste. So the color is really quite interesting. It's redundant. It's, it's got the amber with a tinge of brown. Yeah. Uh, which... It's a beautiful color, actually. Kind of a honey. It looks very much like a honey color. It's kind of like a pale tea. Yeah. Yeah. And that aroma, <sighs> when you are just smelling, at least for me, when I'm smelling it without actually getting in there, it kind of smells like paint thinner. But once I'm in there... No, I get... I get... Honey, floral... Honey notes. Ethanol, a little bit of like a, a caramely yeah. kind of thing going on, yeah. like a burnt sugar. Not burnt, but like... Yeah, and you can still get sugar. that there's... This is this has got some alcohol punch to it, but flavor-wise, at least in the aroma, there's a lot more going on. I even get a little bit of citrus in there. Lots and lots of aromas here. Um, lots of depth. It has that, the pineapple upside down cake char thing. It's got right. that. Minus the pineapple. Yeah, no pineapple. Just the, the you know what I mean. The cooked sugar. Yeah. It's amazing. It yeah. actually smells a lot like a, a bourbon to me. Cool. It's been a while since it's, you've had bourbon. It's been a while since <laughs> I've had bourbon. But... It doesn't really smell like bourbon. It smells like it could be a whiskey, but not really bourbon. Like an American whiskey, almost. Okay. Maybe that's what I meant by saying bourbon. But it smells more like rum, really. All right, let's get in there. Wow. It does not taste like rum. Mm -mm. It tastes like mead. You get the honey sweetness, the honey character. It's thick and luscious in the mouth. We need the guy. It's made from honey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, Wow. Mm. I remember last week we really thought this was awesome, but this is better than I remember. I think sitting for a year to meld and age, this is going to become like, this is truly the nectar of the gods. This stuff already, is incredible. <laughs> already, this is something to behold. It has such a great complexity, but it's still sticking true to the honey notes. Oh, God, yeah. The honey notes are, are there without... You don't have to look for them. They're it like, is unmistakably a mead. Unmistakably. You yeah. cannot say this is anything but a mead. But... But powerful stuff. Ooh, doggy. I... Tastes I, amazing. I can see drinking just a little too much oh, of yeah. this and getting into trouble. It'd be too easy to drink too much of this. Yeah. What's funny is this kind of started out as a meme. Let's make a 30% mead. And, you know, I knew the theories was sound. I knew the practices were sound. I knew all everything about it was a sound concept. I didn't really think it was going to be this good. Mm. I knew it'd be, like, drinkable. Like, all right, you know, you could probably do a mixer or something. It's fine. I thought this is... that the alcohol was going to be too pronounced because it is a flavor. I, I, and I, I'm in the meme world today. What the heck is going on? With the, the guy with the sign? I don't know. Alcohol is a flavor. Change my mind. <laughs> or fight me, or whatever it says. This has changed my life. <laughs> so I thought it was going to ruin the honey notes, but no, no, this is honey first and foremost. Oh, yeah. And then it's alcohol. And the thing is, it's sweet, but we sweetened it to uh, 1.012. Which really isn't that sweet. No. As far as now, the flavor profile. That something to take us. in mind. Um, this was at 1.016, right? And then we started doing all the, the back filling. Fortifying. And that would drop the specific gravity because more alcohol present means more ethanol, which is a 0 0.790 original gravity, or not original gravity, specific gravity. So that would reduce the gravity of it overall. So that 1.012 is probably 
relatively speaking for a normal brew, more like a 1.020 to 1.025, okay? Just so you're aware, it's somewhere in that range, most likely. I could do all the math, but I'm not going to. We're just gonna go say that's approximately where it probably is. Approximately, probably. It's definitely possibly maybe that. <laughs> All right, Brian, I think this is deserving of you taking us on a trip. Okay. Well, if I'm going to do that, I need another sip first. This has something very interesting going for it that most mead and wine does not. And that is because there's so much alcohol, so much is put up into the aroma that you get that before you even get the taste in. And that can be, if you're not used to higher alcohol, a little off-putting. So be careful that you don't just stick your schnoz all the way in there because it'll hurt you. <laughs> this this one's got some, some kick, okay? But once you uh, get accustomed to that... Beware of the schnoz. Yeah, beware of the schnoz. <laughs> once you get accustomed to that, though, as it enters, like as soon as it touches the tongue, it's honey and floral and a touch of citrus. It's like orange with a, a kind of a, like a, it's wildflower honey. So that's where I'm getting the wild flowery type of thing. But it's a nice level of sweetness without being too much. And then you get a little bit of the alcohol burn to come in, which all that does is makes it where, oh, this is sweet. Oh, this is less sweet, but that's nice. It kind of smooths it out and balances it. There's enough acidic astringency there too, that even though this is a very, wild coating your mouth kind of kind of thing the astringency cuts right through that so it doesn't cloy it doesn't stick to your mouth at all and then as you go to swallow the heat of the alcohol comes back a little bit more but it's not bad i don't get the burn in the back of my throat like i do with some whiskeys yeah no and the exhale is just like kind of a hot honey is yeah. the best way to describe yeah. it um just absolutely wonderful from start to finish there's so many levels to this it's incredible. Yeah. Um, another thing that I'm noticing is I'm not getting the fermented honey bitterness. No, I think the alcohol kind of killed it off. <laughs> Get out of here. It took over. <laughs> um, if you decide to make this and you use different things, like somebody asked, can I just use 190 proof Everclear? Well, absolutely you can use that. Just know that it's not going to really bring anything to the party but that heat of ethanol and higher alcohol. That said, the 190 proof, you need less of it. I feel like the cooked notes that we're getting from this are from the rum. Absolutely. I, I totally believe that. Because it has that molasses kind of thing going on. Do but, we have any more tastings tonight? Uh, no, okay. I don't think so. There was a reason I was asking. All right. So, yeah. But it's not reading as rum. It's reading as more like almost boche. Yeah. It, it does not come across like it's, a rum. It's like a cheater boche. <laughs> A little bit. Not really, a little bit. You it, know who I think would really appreciate this is both Adam and Kenny because I know they share our appreciation for rum and... Well, Adam and I have very similar tastes when it comes to hard liquors. Right, so, right. Yeah, he'd uh, love this. I think I think they would both appreciate this. Um, so, so jump into your private jets, guys, and come on down. Yeah, one's in Canada, one's in England. You know. Yeah, no problem. There are, <laughs> they're two of our admins, by the way, for our VIP. <laughs> They're more than our admins. They're our, our good friends. We well, yeah, our admins have become. I friends, know. But, I know. It's, but that's how it started. It's that's how it started. Okay, back to this. You're saying it doesn't taste like rum. I taste some rum notes, but I think the honey character and that the the wildflower floralness, it's coming through surprisingly more than I expected. Like we have made wildflower meads before that didn't have this kind of floral note. Yeah, that time. I was getting a bit of like a, a cherry cordial mm -hmm. kind of note. And not the cherry itself. The enveloping, wrapping the, kind of thing. The warmth. The liquid inside. Oh, where it yeah, has a okay. little bit of the cherry yeah. that the alcohol extruded from mm -hmm. from the cherry. But then that sweet, it, it was... It's a magical combination. It is, it is lovely. And it's, it's really exciting to me that... There's so much complexity and so much depth to this with not that many ingredients. So we need to put a... Numbers. Numbers. Oh, goodness. All right. Let me go over our numbering system for you. It goes from 1 through 10. 
with 11 being on the table for those exceptional cases. Below 1, you probably won't see because those are probably toxic and we would dump them out, though we might talk about it or something. I don't know. A 1 basically means it's not going to kill you to drink it, but you're probably not going to want to. A 10 means that is the one that you, th you say, I think I want to have a drink. That one. I want that one. It comes to mind. And 11 is just the, Wah, you know, all the stars align. And everything in between is from ick to awe. Some. Right. Yeah. That. I, I've been saying it wrong lately. He said ick to ooh last time. I'm I like, said it a couple times. That's the same thing. It got through in one of the videos. And I was like, <laughs> I didn't oh. catch it. Yeah. Oh. yeah. Anyway. So you get the idea. Ick to awe. Yeah, it's a pretty, oh. pretty simple thing. One through 10, you know? Oh. I, mean, I, have, I have debated. I have mentally categorized and compared. I think I have a number. All right. Are you ready? Yeah. One, two, three, 9. eleven. Nine point five. <laughs> we swapped. <laughs> now, if you watched our pineapple um, habanero know. that recently came out, she gave it eleven. We had the exact opposite uh, scoring, and so that was what I was using to score this because me too i i really <laughs> like this but i didn't like it quite as much as that where That's obviously fair. brian this is my wheelhouse yeah. this is totally yeah. me it's if we put some cinnamon and allspice in this it'd be a 13 okay or if I mean, we put some cherry in this or some other fruit yeah. it would be totally this is the closest thing to being a methaglin without being a methaglin. It's the closest thing to a whiskey or a rum yeah. without truly just being a whiskey or rum. So yeah. this puts it squarely in me likey. I mean, it just... <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't... You know, the funny thing is, I was shooting for like a seven when we started. Oh, sure. Make this. I when, was hoping when, this would be a seven. When you came up with this concept, I'm like, really? Do we need to do that to a me? That just seemed wrong, wrong, me, wrong to me. And that's because typically... Our favorite ABV for a mead is about the 12% yeah, ABV. Right there. So going from 12 to 30, I was just like, I don't know about that. I think it's, it's bad things maybe in our future. Ladies and gentlemen, this is not a bad thing. Now, I want to point something out too. If you didn't want to make this such high ABV, you didn't want to use as much rum, you could easily just add enough to bring it past the tolerance of your yeast. Like um, we used... Premier Blanc, I think that's, let's call it 15%, whatever it is. I'm not going to look it up. Let's say it was 15%. If we fortified this to 16 or 17%, using the math that I taught you, then it'd already be done yeah. and you wouldn't have to pasteurize. So it's a really great way to do that. And that's why people have asked about Everclear and things like that. Everclear is a really inexpensive way to do it. I don't personally like the taste that Everclear gives things, but if you just need to boost alcohol a little bit to prevent pasteurization, cool. Now, someone asked the other day, do you need to pasteurize everything? No, you don't. But we sweetened this. If we didn't back sweeten this, if this had gone completely dry and you like it that way, no, you don't have to pasteurize. But once you start adding more fermentable sugars in there, that's when you need to pasteurize or stabilize in some manner. We choose pasteurization, just personal choice. Plus, I look at it like this. I like whiskey and I like mead. Why not have both? Now I get my high proof spirits and I get my mead all in one. You know, like that meme. Why not both? Yeah, I think that's a great, great note to leave it's, this on. It actually is like, that's how I've been thinking of this. So I, I thought that was cool. Um, but anyway, make this or make something like it. And enjoy it. it. Let us know <laughs> how yours came out too, yeah. because if you used a different spirit or used a different thing, it could come out quite different. So I'm really curious what everybody's variations on yeah, this like were. Yeah, you could put whiskey in this. Oh God, yeah. You could do almost anything with this. Like you could do almost like a, a Jack Daniels honey or a wild turkey oh, honey yeah, yeah. version. Yeah. Like that could be pretty amazing. I oh, I want to do that. See? See? All right. I got to go make this. All right, everybody. <laughs> thanks you so much for watching and have a great day. Bye-bye.